In this contaminant identification course, you will learn which critical questions can be answered by contaminant identification and how this impacts your response. You will also gain an understanding of how to interpret the information related to contaminant identification and which reference materials are useful. Finally, this course will make you more aware of clues that can be used to help identify or at least classify the various contaminants. The term contaminant is used broadly in this course to mean any hazardous substance including chemical, radiological, or biological agents. For illustrative purposes, the primary focus of this course will be chemical agents. The initial step in response is first recognizing that any incident or a patient's complaint may involve hazardous materials. As a member of the decontamination response team, you may be called upon to determine whether an incident involves hazardous materials and what actions to take. If you don't make the appropriate inquiries or fail to recognize that hazardous materials may be involved, you may put yourself and others in harm's way. In other words, if you don't recognize the presence or potential presence of hazardous substances, you become part of the problem and cannot be part of the solution. When confronted with a contaminated patient, there are basically two scenarios that occur with regard to contaminant identification. Either the victim or responders know for sure what the contaminant is, or they don't. If they do, you can quickly access various resources to identify proper decon response procedures. If the victim or responders don't know, or they are unsure what the contaminant is, you can still use various clues to help determine the hazards associated with the agent. These clues include the patient's symptoms, the presence of a particular odor or residue, or a description of symbols or illustrations found on the package label or a vehicle placard. In the end, it is not uncommon for response decisions to be made on either too little or too much information. The effectiveness of the response depends upon how this information is interpreted. The correct path requires a set of questions to be answered using the tools found in this course. In every emergency decontamination operation, a number of key decisions need to be made. First, you need to decide how hazardous the contaminant is. Second, you will want to determine the level and method of decontamination required. If other responders will be involved, the required level of personal protective equipment must be established. Finally, you will need to gather as much information as possible so you can make good post-incident decisions regarding cleanup of the decon equipment and area. These issues should be running through your mind each time you are confronted with a contaminated patient. Knowing the identity of the contaminant is only part of the objective. Gathering and interpreting information on the hazard helps you make good decisions provide appropriate patient care, and allows you to anticipate problems that may occur during and after the decontamination operation. An agent is considered hazardous when, because of its quantity, concentration, or physical characteristics, it poses a real hazard to human health or the environment. Health hazards may be acute or chronic and include skin, eye, and tissue irritation, sensitization of the immune system, cell and organ injury, cancer formation, and death. The toxicity of a chemical varies depending upon the dose and route of exposure. Exposure routes include inhalation, ingestion, absorption, and injection. Toxicity is usually described in terms of potency or how much agent is required to produce a toxic effect. The lower the dose that produces an effect, the more potent the agent is considered. Toxicity is also defined in terms of a chemical's mechanism of action or the specific toxic effect a chemical has on cells and tissues. Because a chemical must get into your body to harm you, it is crucial to understand that a chemical's physical state greatly impacts its ability to affect your body. This also emphasizes the importance of wearing the appropriate personal protective equipment when dealing with a contaminated patient to avoid cross-contamination and exposing yourself.
Chemicals exist in three physical states, gas, liquid, and solid. A gas has a relatively low density and viscosity, and can expand and contract with changes in pressure and temperature. Gases tend to move rapidly and pose the greatest threat of sudden engulfment, especially when released in an enclosed environment. A vapor is a gaseous form of a substance which is solid or liquid under ordinary conditions. An aerosol is the dispersion of very fine particles of a solid or liquid in a gas, fog, foam, or mist. Liquids are also very mobile and flow downhill along paths of least resistance. Mists are droplets of liquids that become airborne. Solids are the least mobile, but solid dust particles can become airborne and act like a mist or vapor cloud. A chemical's physical state can be influenced by its environment. A gas can be pressurized to become a liquid. A liquid can be cooled to become a solid, and a solid can be heated to produce a liquid. Some toxic chemicals produce a distinct and clinically recognizable toxic syndrome called a toxidrome. Toxidromes usually are associated with a class of chemicals rather than one specific compound. An example would be an organophosphate pesticide or a chemical warfare nerve agent. Individuals exposed to these compounds display characteristic signs and symptoms including constricted pupils, copious secretions, difficulty breathing, and weakness. Recognition of a toxidrome can be an important step in the diagnosis of an unidentified exposure. The classification of chemicals by their toxidrome is only one way we can use a chemical's effects or appearance to help us make decisions in managing contaminated patients. Another way is associating a contaminant with a specific class of compounds so you can more easily predict the adverse effects that may occur. This approach is a good starting point when someone on your emergency decontamination team is gathering more specific information. Sometimes it is even the end point of a contaminant identification. There are hundreds of thousands of different chemicals found in pure form or in various combinations that are used daily both in industry and in the household. Trying to learn about all of these chemicals is well beyond the scope of most hospital emergency decontamination teams. In general, chemicals can be divided into several classes. Corrosives are substances that lack any toxicological activity, but are able to produce severe tissue destruction through a direct chemical reaction. Most common are the strong acids or bases, but any strong oxidizing or reducing agent may also be included. This class of agents is used heavily in industry, agriculture, and in homes. After exposure, you may see skin irritation, burns, chemical conjunctivitis to severe eye damage, shortness of breath, nausea, and vomiting. Pesticides are a class of chemicals found in various physical states and are among the most poisonous agents used in agriculture and landscaping. This group includes both organophosphates such as parathion, malathion, and chemical warfare nerve agents and carbamates. A victim of pesticide exposure may exhibit a wide range of symptoms commonly referred to as dumbbells. Dumbbells is an acronym for defecation, urination, meiosis, bronchospasm or bronchorrhea, emesis, lacrimation, and salivation. Pesticides are often mixed with solvents to aid in their application, so the victim's initial presenting signs and symptoms may be confused with solvent exposures. A solvent is a class of liquids that can dissolve another material. In industry, the term solvent is generally applied to substances known as organic solvents that are widely used to dissolve organic chemicals, such as oils and resins. Examples of solvents include kerosene, acetone, and petroleum distillates. Potential solvent uses are limitless and include degreasing, cleaning, stripping, thinning, and finishing. Solvents are used extensively in many industries. These agents can be carcinogens, corrosives, irritants, sensitizers, or have specific end organ effects. Contaminated victims or those with prolonged exposures may present with nausea, vomiting, shortness of breath, headache, skin irritation, dizziness, and confusion. Flammable substances are chemicals that have the capacity to ignite and burn. These can be solids, liquids, or gases. 
flammable and combustible products are readily available and used for a wide variety of purposes. Gasoline is the most common. Others include paint solvents, lighter fluid, dry cleaning agents, butane, pesticides, oil, spray paint, kerosene, propane, diesel fuel, turpentine, nail polish, and natural gas. Ionizing radiation is energy produced from unstable atoms that make up compounds such as plutonium and uranium. These atoms work to become more stable by releasing their excess energy as either charged particles, such as alpha and beta, or high-energy gamma waves and X-rays. When this energy strikes living tissue or is taken into the body, structural changes may occur, resulting in cancer, birth defects, bone marrow damage, and death. Ionizing radiation is an invisible hazard and requires specialized detection equipment to check for its presence. Radiation sickness is an illness which symptoms result from excessive exposure to ionizing radiation, with victims presenting with persistent nausea and vomiting within hours of exposure. Oxidizers are a very reactive class of substances that either release oxygen or cause oxygen to combine with another element or compound. Since oxygen is an essential element of combustion, this class of compounds can produce a self-contained source of energy to fuel reactions. Oxidation reactions are usually very exothermic, which means they give off heat. Therefore, if a compound says oxidizer, this means that it can cause other materials to combust more readily upon contact or make fires burn more fiercely. Examples include chlorates found in herbicides, hydrogen peroxide, chlorine, and oxygen. Asphyxiants are agents that displace oxygen or prevent cells from using oxygen. Simple asphyxiants are gases that, when present in high concentrations in the atmosphere, lead to a reduction in the amount of oxygen that is available. Atmospheres deficient in oxygen do not provide adequate sensory warning of danger, and most simple asphyxiants are odorless. Unconsciousness and death can rapidly ensue in an environment that is deficient in oxygen. There have been a considerable number of asphyxiation deaths among inappropriately protected workers who have entered confined spaces or tanks before these spaces were adequately vented or gas tested. Examples of simple asphyxiants include propane, methane, argon, and helium. Chemical asphyxiants such as cyanide, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen sulfide render the body incapable of utilizing an adequate oxygen supply. They are active at very low concentrations. When the contaminant cannot be positively identified, you need to rely on clues and pieces of information to help guide the decontamination decision-making process. Much of this can be gleaned from interviewing the patient, bystanders, and pre-hospital emergency responders. You should focus your investigation on key questions such as the ones listed here. The first question in your investigation should be, where did the incident occur? Knowing where the incident occurred can provide vital information about the chemical's identification. Consider the following occupancies and locations and the potential for the presence of hazardous substances in each. An outbuilding on a farm. Think of pesticides and herbicides. A swimming pool sales store. Think of chlorine. A greenhouse. Pesticides and herbicides. A metal plating or finishing shop. Corrosives, solvents, cyanide, heavy metals. A woodworking shop. Solvents, glues, acids, paints. A residential garage. Solvents, cleaners, hydrocarbons, pesticides, herbicides. A vehicle accident involving any truck. Hydrocarbons, corrosives, solvents, combustibles. An illegal drug lab. Solvents, heavy metals, and hydrous ammonia, freon, corrosives. Various types of containers are used to transport, handle, and store specific materials, both hazardous and non-hazardous. A container's appearance can tell you a lot about the product it holds and the related hazards. Examples of transportation vehicles include a box trailer, flatbed, dry bulk, van, tank trailer, tube trailer, and personal vehicle. 
In general, the more sturdy or well-protected a container or transport vehicle is, the more hazardous its contents are. Vehicles that transport certain quantities or types of a hazardous substance must be affixed with a placard identifying its hazard class. All placards are shaped like a square on point with various color patterns denoting the different hazard classes. Containers are very often marked with labels in a similar fashion. This information combined with shipping papers may prove to be very useful. Many chemicals produce distinct odors. Some solvents smell like paint. Corrosives are irritating to the eyes and throat. And hydrocarbons routinely smell like acetone or paint thinner. For response purposes, if you smell the agent, you probably inhaled it. If you can taste it, you probably inhaled it and may have ingested it. If adverse effects develop acutely, then you are probably dealing with a fairly toxic agent. If it has been hours since the contamination and the victim remains asymptomatic, then the toxicity of the agent is probably minimal. Once initial or final confirmation is made, various resources need to be consulted to obtain information on decontamination, personal protective equipment, and anticipated health risks. Informational resources include the local fire department, Safety data sheets, or SDS, which businesses are required to make readily available for any hazardous agent used on site. ATSDR medical management guidelines. Chemtrek, the Chemical Transportation Emergency Center, serves as a round-the-clock resource for obtaining immediate critical response information for incidents involving hazardous materials and dangerous goods. Poison Control Center. Radiation Emergency Assistance Center. Online chemical databases. Wiser, the wireless information system for emergency responders, produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, is a free app which provides a quick and comprehensive tool for helping to identify the chemical, plan, and manage your response. View a full list of resources and contact information in our library. Jamie, the hospital pharmacist, is responsible for the contaminant ID sector in the hospital's incident command system. After the first victim arrives and a hazmat code is called, she responds to the emergency department to begin gathering data on the contaminant. Jamie interviews the first victim and finds out that a motor vehicle accident occurred and a drum with a black and white sticker with a test tube on it came from the box truck this victim ran into. Looking at her emergency response guide for DOT labels, Jamie suspects that a corrosive material was involved. This is consistent with the victim's presenting signs of skin irritation, burns, conjunctivitis, and shortness of breath. Jamie calls Central Dispatch, who is able to confirm from the hazmat team at the scene that the involved agent is indeed a corrosive material, hydrochloric acid. To gather further information on the agent, Jamie calls Chemtrek to get a safety data sheet or SDS for hydrochloric acid faxed to the hospital. Chemical manufacturers must prepare a safety data sheet for each of their products and supply it to users of the chemicals. This document identifies the chemical composition of the product, its physical properties, and proper handling procedures. It also assesses the physical and health hazards of each product. This includes primary routes of entry, exposure limits, whether the chemical is a carcinogen, precautions for safe handling and use, control measures, and emergency and first aid procedures. After receiving the SDS, Jamie must now evaluate and interpret the information to help the decon unit leader adjust and or reinforce their current decontamination and personal protective equipment decisions. The format of an SDS is standardized, which allows Jamie to quickly scan the document for useful information. While Jamie is researching, look for the answers to three of the critical questions she must answer. Section 1. Identification. This section identifies the chemical as well as its recommended uses. 
It also provides the essential contact information of the supplier. A quick review provides Jamie with an emergency contact number to learn more about the agent, which is also called muriatic acid. Section 2. Hazard Identification This section of the SDS identifies the hazards of the chemical and the appropriate warning information associated with the hazards. By reviewing this section, Jamie quickly learns that hydrochloric acid is dangerous, it is a corrosive, and can cause serious eye and skin irritation and damage. Section 3. Composition and Information on Ingredients This information is very useful if you are dealing with a commercial product made up of several ingredients. In this case, we are only dealing with hydrochloric acid and water. Section 4. First Aid Measures This section describes the initial first aid that should be provided to an individual who has been exposed to the chemical. Descriptions of the most important symptoms, both acute and delayed, are provided. For hydrochloric acid, this includes flushing the eyes and skin with plenty of water for several minutes. This confirms for Jamie that water decontamination should occur immediately after clothing removal, if not already underway. She reports this information to the decon unit leader. Section 5. Firefighting Measures If the chemical causes a fire, appropriate steps are provided in this section. Jamie learns that hydrochloric acid is non-flammable, but if a fire would occur, it should be contained with water. Section 6. Accidental Release Measures If hydrochloric acid is spilled or released, appropriate steps must be taken that must begin with wearing personal protective equipment that includes a NIOSH-approved respirator with an acid gas filter. Hand protection must include gloves made of natural latex, butyl rubber, nitrile, and or neoprene. Section 7. Handling and Storage Hydrochloric acid needs to be stored in a cool, well-ventilated place. Jamie makes note of this information when the cleanup phase of the decontamination operation occurs. Section 8. Protection Information This section is key for Jamie to review since it provides guidance on PPE. In a quick glance, she learns that the decon team must wear chemical protective clothing and a respirator. The PPE routinely worn by the decon team should provide adequate protection, and Jamie passes this information on to the decon unit leader. Section 9. Physical Data Jamie reviews the physical and chemical properties of the substance or mixture. Jamie learns that hydrochloric acid has a strong, pungent smell and is soluble in water. This helps confirm that traditional decontamination showering is appropriate. Section 10. Stability and Reactivity Hydrochloric acid is stable but will react mildly with water to produce heat. With this information, Jamie confirms that a high-volume, low-pressure shower is required to ensure adequate decontamination to avoid harmful effects. Section 11. Toxicological Information a review of this section reinforces to Jamie that hydrochloric acid causes acute injury on contact but does not have chronic effects such as causing cancer or result in negative reproductive effects. Section 12. Ecological Effects This section provides information to evaluate an agent's impact on the environment if released. This information is not directly pertinent to this incident. Section 13. Disposal Considerations Jamie learns that a waste disposal company will need to be contacted during cleanup to ensure contaminated equipment and patient's clothing is properly handled. The remaining three sections of the hydrochloric acid SDS do not provide any additional direction for this emergency decontamination operation. Did you find the answers to your questions? Click yes or no for each one. Jamie decides next to focus on patient care issues after the initial decontamination information is completed. Jamie can utilize several resources to cross-reference and help determine accuracy of the information that she has gathered. One is WISER, another is the ATSDR Medical Management Guidelines, and finally, the Regional Poison Control Center. WISER, the Wireless Information System for Emergency Responders, is available for download on their website. WISER is a system designed to assist personnel in hazardous material incidents. Developed by the National Library of Medicine, 
Wiser provides a wide range of information on hazardous substances, including substance identification support, physical characteristics, and human health information. Features include rapid access to the most important information about a hazardous substance in an intuitive and simple platform. Topics covered include comprehensive decision support, including assistance in identification of an unknown chemical or chemical syndrome, and guidance on the immediate actions necessary to save lives. Access to the Hazardous Substances Data Bank and Chemical Hazards Medical Management content, which contains a wealth of detailed, peer-reviewed information on hazardous substances. User profiles enable users to specify the role they are currently filling, such as first responder, hazmat specialist, EMS specialist, hospital provider, or preparedness planner. The application interface is customized so that the information most relevant to the respective job can be quickly accessed. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, or ATSDR, developed the Medical Management Guidelines for Acute Chemical Exposures to aid emergency department physicians and other emergency healthcare professionals who manage acute exposures resulting from chemical incidents. These guidelines are intended to help make decon and PPE selection decisions and direct the medical evaluation and treatment of exposed and contaminated persons. They are available on ATSDR's website. The medical management guidelines provide basic chemical and exposure information, a summary of potential health effects, pre-hospital management information, emergency department management information, and information for the patient upon discharge. All of the resources Jamie researched recommended clothing removal followed by decontamination shower. The areas of greatest concern are respiratory, skin and eye exposure, and ingestion potential. Routine airway management is recommended, including the use of bronchodilators. Chemical skin burns should be managed very similar to thermal burns without the additional fluid requirements. The eyes should be examined for corneal damage and, if found, require copious irrigation followed by ophthalmology consultation. Jamie is advised not to induce vomiting if ingestion is suspected. Rather, a consultation with a gastroenterologist is advised. Hazmat emergency decontamination decisions should be based on existing information if available. If not available, Response decisions should be based on the patient's symptoms and possibly other clues gained from interviewing the victim or others. Multiple resources may need to be utilized to gather good chemical data. Excellent resources include the Poison Control Center, the Fire Service, members of local industry, and various online resources.